Bonsoir à tous. Today, railway. But not of any kind. I'm talking madness. But not on madness. On Mobius. This video will be an analysis of a 15 cycle playthrough in Railway Reflection 2. By yours truly. You see, when Railway 2 came out, the infinite cycle mechanic made me dream and hope for interesting survival trials at high cycle counts. And instead, like most dreams, I got pains and disillusions. Mostly pains. In this video, I'm gonna present my team, the buffs in place, and make a commentary for each successful stations fight, with a counter for the number of tries it took. I won't detail all of the bosses or sinners mechanics, so I'll assume you know more or less what is going on. Several wikis have them if you need to check. As a small resume of my achievements, here is my Railway 1 banner. I completed Railway 2 once blind with a burn team, to discover it and retry the Leus. Fun, but nothing incredible. Then I completed it a second time with a more traditional team for the 150 turns. Yeah, I could have chosen a slightly better team. So this is officially my third run. First, a small presentation of the wall of Earth I've gone through. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, so here are my thousand pains. Those accumulating buffs are the biggest bane in this wall railway. To be fair, offense and defense level upgrades already increase damage dealt and reduce damage taken, plus also increase clash values. With the other buffs and Abnos passive, there is no need to add an additional 10% damage bonus per cycle. And this will be my biggest complaint for this railway. Because if you are not Keiko Ponglu, there is a point where you just cannot tank. Even your resistances. Which, funnily enough, made me completely fall in love with evade skills. To the point where my Weiwa team went from this to this. But more on this later. The other symptoms you can get are not hitting enemies and granting them huge offense level boosts, and trust me, it will be relevant. Your sinners hitting the same slot over and over while wondering when the walls will break. The slot increase is particularly annoying for dealing with ads. Starting to pray at any god at each restart because you cannot retarget the 10 plus speeds enemies and you really need to evade more than one skill. Your sinners healing the enemies by taking more damage than they can deal. And finally, lucky you, your egos won't save you after depleting your siege gauge faster than the enemy's life. All these buffs at cycle 5 seems annoying but nothing too hard. But once you got all of them 3 times, that's where the shukarunis begin. But don't fear, because for these arduous tasks, I have assembled the most competent team at the time. I lied. For information, I started this run a bit before Sinclair's fail and ego release, unfortunately. Here is also a quick look at the egos. I don't have too much thread spins or uptie 4, because I'm slightly very stingy. You probably have several questions already, but let's go in order. I took Spice Bush Shi Sang, because I'm not going poise, that means it is its most reliable ID. I am going for a sinking core, so it does fit right in, and help me a ton and two halves. I took a 3 sloth egos by default, because I wouldn't use the other two anyway. Faust is great because it's the most reliable ID overall with high values, evade, and sins feeding into fluid sack. I took fluid sack over teleport for obvious reasons, aka heal and no charge. Done as their sync ID, for several reasons. The main one being that I was not gonna use any charge ID anyway, and I lacked her clashing potential overall, and I still do, so I just wanted to play her. And she does fit pretty well in the more polyvalent game style I had. That also means fluid sack instead of teleport. Ryoshu is chef for one main reason, her healing passive. It seems situational, but healing around 20 HP per kill does matter a lot in the long run. If you can kill 30 enemies, that's already 600 HP healed. And you can actually find quite a few occasions, mainly on ads. And the fox has ads, the fairies have ads, wayward has ads, and T-Corp are ads. Also, I wanted her skill 3 as a nice finisher and for Amnos like fail and turn. For Egos, I chose a base one for lower cost, and Red Eyes open for more versatility since I was not going burn. I also didn't have Red Eyes at that time, but not too big of a deal. Chef Hiroshu also helped me a lot with her bleed abilities, which transitions perfectly for Arc or Mersault. Since I was not gonna bring charge, I have zero reason to go for W Corp, and since I wasn't going for nails, N Corp didn't feel very justified. I mainly wanted a tank. I ended up choosing R Corp for his higher skill values, block skill, and bleed. I don't regret my choice, but I'm now thinking that I could maybe also have played N-Corp. Pursuance over Capote for obvious survival reasons. Anglu is K-Corp, no question asked. I mainly wanted survivability at that point, and K-Corp was the cornerstone. End of questions. Rosiate over Soda because it's just too situational and I didn't need another ego eating gloom. Then I chose Heathcliff's Sun Shower. I'm gonna have to justify this one, right? 
Okay, so, as I said, I wanted to have a sinking core, and this gives skill 1 and counter both inflict sinking, which helps. Then skill 2 is really strong against units like so that one will cry or centipede. Skill 3 is just stronger. But most of all, again, I wanted survivability. And I'm not gonna ask that of Harkly, am I? Though with evade in the end I could have. Plus, since I was not going for speedruns, a mouse could be an annoyance. In the end, it is still the better choice. I think. I didn't have much of a choice at this time for egos. Next, Mora Ishmael, one of my two thinking pillars. Our Ishmael could have been an option, I guess, but Mora is more reliable, and I was not going for charge anyway. Rosie had desire over Capote, because not going burn. Yet she Rodian, the second thinking pillar. A beast in both tanking and damage or sinking, much more fitting than Rose Spanners or the two stars. Ramshank is gonna be really useful, but becomes less mandatory in later cycles. Sinclair has his Encorp ID. Then notice. Wait, you wanted me to explain? Well, just his best ID, and really good for clashing and damage in this throwaway. I guess after all, Mariachi could have been a sinking addition, but sometimes you just need raw damages and values, and that's one of those times. Impending day over lifetime stew, because I'm not gonna proc the heal on heads with Encorp, and also because I'm gonna corrode. A lot. Lantern Ego wasn't there at that point, unfortunately. Then notice as a Sivan ID. The main and only reason I didn't use a Molar ID is because I didn't have it. As I said, sometimes you just need high values and discard. She doesn't tank too well, and her clashing values outside of skill 2 are erf. She tanked a few times, but Mola might have just done better. The gluttony skill 1 is nice in the end, but that's about it. I took some shower over the other for value and that's all. Gregor was a complicated choice. You might wonder, if I wanted tanks, why didn't I take his Vi ID? The reason is heal passive. I was going for 100 of turns. Healing 5 HP per turn on 700 turns is 3500 HP. It is not a question. So I had only 3 choices. I crossed base, obviously. I ended up with Sushev because I already decided to take Chef Ryoshu, so the synergy was nice, and also with Blade. G Corp passive being on clashes only was also a big decider, and the idea not synergizing with the rest of the team. For ego, I chose the Ledger Domain, obviously. And that's it for the team. Now for the buffs I chose, be careful, you might be surprised! Not really. Thinking is an obvious choice with what I said. Bleed though, not as much. I ended up choosing it after checking my IDs, and mainly because of the fox. I maybe could have chosen a couple of damage increase or either lust or slash, mainly for fail and turn, and I did end up trying to add one for this cycle. And to finally end this introduction, I've got a little game for you. In this run, and the row in general, three fights proved to be a major pain in my ass which I like to call the three mofos. Try to guess them before they come up. But for now, it is time to start this journey with the first station, and for the 16th time, so that no one will cry. And as a small hint, he isn't one of them. So that no one will cry, no matter the cycle, is a pushover. Its values are really low, so as long as you evade, you'll avoid most damage. But even without, a good tank is more than enough with a few clashes. My only retry was a tricky turn 1 targeting. The main point of concern would be turn 4 because of his skill, but sinking stacking deals so much damage that even with HP buffs, he melts easily. The fight is really straightforward, this was one body part with non psyching IDs and stack on the other. I'm choosing to stack on the arm because of easy clashes and early stagger plus increased damage by blunt E4 stagger. As you can see, I went with all four sinking members plus Sinclair for blunt, Faust for support and evade, and on for clashes and gloom skills. One thing to say that is also valuable for future fights. Turn 1 should not necessarily be spent on stacking sinking, as you might get too many hits, even with the helping passive. The main goal is to have any sort of sinking on the part you want to focus before the start of next turn. The main reason for that is the way railway buffs work. If the part has no sinking by its application, the count will be 1, effectively wasting it. Unless Spice Bush evades, but that's a special case. So you want to finish the turn with a sinking skill, or use a Spice Bush skill, as it will add sinking before the sinking buff. His skill 2 is especially good, because it inflicts 9 sinking with 3 count because of the passive. Anyway, that's about it for this fight. The last thing is to try and save your stronger skill for next fight. The biggest thing I do is trying to save Sinclair skill 3. I could try to affect the turn count also, by trying to get one more or less turn, 
but that's slightly too annoying for me, so I'll just regret it next fight. I'll let you watch the end of this fight, and I'll come back for the next station. Here is Team Machine. And the first morpho. Let's pause for a sec and look at this bullshit. This passive is a bane of high cycles. If this amno is annoying in lower cycles for its tankiness, it is even more annoying in higher cycles for its unwinnable clashes and incalculable damage. You see that description? You see the damage cap? Me neither. But I see the percentage over it. Tanking that? If you get up on Lou, maybe. Except if he takes a really huge hit, which can happen on this fight. I did replace done by Onglu for this fight though. The worst part? It's attack power up. You can't just evade it. The only solution? Be fast. And lucky. Breaking the body is essential, so it loses its count. But breaking the steam blaster is also important for more damage and avoiding it crushing you. I brought the sinking team because not only it is a good way to kill it after, but the colors match. Soth and Envy are skills you want for this fight, and especially Blunt. Luckily, we have that a lot. Sinclair's skill 3 can stagger the Steam Blaster by itself if under the 3 fragile turn, which was my goal. Unfortunately, this cycle, the fight was especially nasty. Very high speed meant a lot of retries for targeting, and the turn count was even, meaning I couldn't stagger the parts quickly, even with all my best skills. It ended up being a shit fest of retries until I found a luckier setup. This ended up costing me a ton of scene resources, but I didn't want to spend more than an hour on this fight. <laughs>
くいけしそくだ。けおぶれ。ベアレジチ。ティコンギョグン、ゲボケトンゴカタ。머리좋다탈퇴탄이완전좋았어깨달았나경력은판단력에깨서주마적들이뭔가기분이좋아보이는것같아카론기분나빠 I managed to start sinking on the main body while slamming the blaster with Sinclair Skill 3. Got them both on stagger in the second turn, allowing me to put down the blaster and almost finishing the body. It still wasn't destroyed in turn 4, but with some retargeting and Rimshank passive, I could get it down. After the hardest is done, as long as I'm careful enough to not make stupid mistakes, I can actually win clashes and survive hits before sinking down the body. With so much sinking, even with resistance, it will hurt a lot. Usually I'd keep his sank skill 3 to finish faster, but I had to waste it earlier in the fight. Otherwise, you could have seen something sexy like this. But that's it for one, if not the hardest fight in the cycle. Next, the fox. 
And this is where the other part of the team comes in, aka the bleed core. Ryoshu, Mersault and Gregor are the main bleed sources. Dan is useful for clashes and Basigo can hurry the bleed process. Anglu is a stick, and while Faust nails don't seem to work with the passive, Fluid Sack is primordial to counter the field SP drop. Otis is there for moral support. Skill 2 is useful and Ebony's stem can be helpful against the umbrellas. The strat here is stacking bleed, which will be the main source of damage. The team isn't optimized for this, so the process can be a bit slow, but the count will always be high. As you may see, I am primarily stacking on the body rather than the head. The reason for this is the number of skills and coins. The rotation is always 1 skill for the body and 4 for the head, then the opposite, after the umbrellas with counters, and finally 3 skills on the body plus 2 on the head. So there is already more skills on the body. But also, all skills on the body have 2 coins, except counter, while half of the ones on the head have only 1 coin. So for blitz stacking, targeting the body is overall better. Plus it is easier to start stacking on turn 1 with only 1 skill. The first turn was tricky with the targeting, forcing me to do some retries, but the biggest problem I encountered was for turns 3 and 4. I can hardly kill umbrellas as AoE egos get absorbed by the increased slot weights. Corrosion can bypass that with random targeting, making them really useful, but the lack of control makes them more random, meaning more retries. If you hit the fox with it on counter, you will also take a beating. However, you do want to hit the fox on turn 3, because otherwise, Opportunistic will proc. Yeah, remember that? It is actually very dangerous. So I have to dedicate at least one attack for this, while trying to kill at least one or two umbrellas. Chain of Others is great for that, so I sacrifice Mersault for this. On turn 4, very few can contest the AoE, and tanking it is not an option, which is usually my main source of retries on this station. Once past that, it becomes smooth sailing, but in the meantime, it is a pain. There, I did use Legend Main for clashing with one skill and inflicting paralysis, so Anglu's Rosier Desire is almost assured to win the clash.
As a few tricks and advices, when playing bleed, purposefully losing clashes with more coins is a good way of proccing a lot of bleed, which can be important at some point as long as you can tank it. OT, skill 3 or Onglu in general are good for this. So Chef Gregor also tanks well slash and gluttony, so I also use them for it. In the end, I managed to skip the 30% HP phase, which let me avoid a lot of complications. Now, the T-Corp agents. For them, I brought the Sinking Gang with Faust, Don, and Ryoshu for Pierce and Evade, and Onglu instead of Rogen for tanking duty. My game plan is to survive two turns each wave. You'll see why. Luckily, they don't do too much damage. And luckily, this first turn setup was atrocious and cost me a lot of retries, so much that I replaced Heathcliff by Rogen, who had a better setup, mainly for Sinking Infliction. However, they aren't usually particularly hard. Evades have some trouble with non-slot skills, but can still work. I don't do much damage, but that's not the goal. Ideally, I want sinking for round 2 stacking. I don't really have much direct damage, and they have a few weaknesses and 50 plus defense levels, but I don't need it anyway. Now for turn 2. Simple. Same as round 1. But this time my goal is to get them at minus 45 sanity with the sinking. Unfortunately, as revealed in the patch note, their sanity is not taken into account for their coin rolls, making it less interesting. But don't worry, because something else very nice happens. As you can see, they get staggered. Now, the really fun thing is, they do not recover from panic. Ever. Once they are in that state, I can take my sweet time dealing with them. I don't care about turns anyway. This allows me to use skill 1s and try to time for Yoshu to kill them. This also allows me to get rid of skill 1s to make my wave too easier. Also, if they're passive procs and they get back to full life, it's too bad, but they still do not recover from panic. I'll let you all enjoy the second wave and I'll come back for the start of the next half of this cycle. Oh, 
보이네요. 직접 알게 한 달려란 루신한테 저는 승리한다! 완벽한 한방 시원한걸? 
We are getting into the second half, and I present to you the second move of the run. In low cycles, it's easy to kill it without it doing anything, but we are not in low cycles. This thing has 45% more max HP, fairy included, 15 more defense levels, and heals a lot. Plus, charm targets have randomized skills, and that adds a lot to the retry counter. Its annoying passive also prevents sinking and bleeding from working. Still helps a bit on the fairy though. Which is why I brought this team containing all my slashes, lust, and pride skills. Luckily, even with all the damage bonuses, it doesn't do that much damage as long as you avoid AoE. Also funny, but opportunistic doesn't seem to work. PM shenanigans, I guess. Now, the main problem is not only fairy killing is very random due to skills and targets, but its stagger thresholds are also harder to get, so I often have to spend the first time clashing or avoiding, and staggering it the second time it comes out. The best case is me doing just enough damage to end right before the second stagger threshold, so I can easily stagger it the third time it comes out. Then I break the body in the following turn, before slowly ending its life somehow, either in one turn or two. The most annoying thing is, because of the randomness, retries can be very frequent.
The start of this attempt was harsh, as I couldn't even stagger it on the second time it came out. However, I was pretty lucky overall, as I got a lot of my skills straight afterwards, allowing me to stagger it easily, then killing it the next time it came out. I took a lot of damage, and had to spend a few fluid sack, but I'll take it. Now, Centipede. This one was a candidate for Morpho number 3, and in the end, 
800. This thing has a very annoying tendency to force you to restart because of its turn 2 setup. Notorious, I know. But the worst part is probably that even when you are past it, if you didn't win all your clashes, you have an extremely scary rampaging phase, so you can't chill at any time. And the voids are not as useful. I bring back the full sinking team like for so that no cry. Heathcliff is not optimal I think, so I could have brought something else. The game plan is a classic one. Sink the head while trying to avoid it getting charged. In this attempt, I first destroy its shield without ego. The second turn setup isn't ideal, but I'll manage to pass it while keeping sinking. Since its sinking passive is a pretty big lie, I pay attention to avoid breaking the chain on his head mainly. The fight turns a bit sour though, and I have to avoid some skills, so it's gonna keep some charge. But I'm not going for turns anyway, so I still try. The last turns get very scary, with it hard targeting if Cliff stuck with skill 1, but I still managed to finish it just in time. And so we move on.
Ah, the fairies. The last chill time in the run. Those guys have not really high rolls. Almost only one coin skills. Adds for healing, three turns, all that we love. Main damage source for both those fairies will be sinking. My first target will be the round gentleman. It's hard to be precise. Classic and simple. The game plan is simply to wait and manage sinking infliction until they are ready to be harvested. For this job, I brought the sinking gang again, obviously, without T-Sang, but with Don and Ryoshu for Pierce additional damage and passive, plus Mersault for tanking, and as a leftover for my bleeding ideas. The only two things to worry about are avoiding to let long legs get opportunistic, which I forget, and his summon skill high value. I don't necessarily have to clash with it, but I still do.
てみましょうか。Very gentle man dies around his self-stagger skill, and after that it's long legs time. 
And while I was beating his friend, he got 50 sinking potency and count on his body and head. The head is easy to target, so after 2 or 3 turns of focus fire, he's done for. Overall easy fight. I didn't go for fully optimal strats outside of early sinking management and gentlemen, but still won without too much trouble. The final fight of the cycle, Wayward Passenger. And this last fight was a contender for Morphono 3 for a very long time. He already has high base damage, but with all the bonuses, it's indecent. And there is just no way to have a discounter, as I don't really have enough damage for Stagger. Maybe with Sinclair, but I just tried multiple ways of tanking, with Ryoshu and Gregor, who are resistant to Slash. Until I realized, if I don't hit it, no counter! And so, my evade dance with his left blade began. And as I found more way to counter his BS, I started enjoying this fight way more. Giving this team, with all my evade IDs, plus on glue because broken tank, and Gregor for legitimate duties. This attempt in particular was very graceful, as I could avoid a lot of skills with only Faust. Evades rock. But even then, portal breaking is a pain. Slot weights require corrosions if you want to use AoE, and health increase is pain increase. Mine. I still try to avoid letting the blue alive in priority, then it's pretty much about which I can kill. He sank Sun Shower and Gregor let Jadomain are great for this. A bonus time would be great too if I kept Otis, which I didn't. I hesitated for a while, but decided to use the sank Sun Shower corrosion, which helped me a lot. Then I just finished the two portals left next turn. When he comes back, that's the time. With this Sanctum 1 skill and 2 turns of being out, he is full of sinking, and that's the time to strike. He has opportunistic active, so you have to be careful about clashes and counter as usual. I am lucky there though, as he has lower speed, so I can easily play around his skills. I use Gregor to tank with Legendomain for paralysis, but it hurts a lot more than I thought. But still can break both blades easily, 
especially we see Sang's kill streak. Once the two blades are out, it's beating time. With all the sinking accumulated, his life rapidly shrinks, and in about two turns, without being able to escape into other dimensions, he finally bites the dust. And yeah, just got saved by bleed really hard right there. And that's the end of cycle 15. Now what? At first I thought to continue this run until something like cycle 20 and show sign of roses in another video. However, after all those cycles, it became more of a chore than anything. Don't get me wrong, it was still fun. Finding new ways to play to counteract this game's bullshit was interesting and the achievement after dozens of retries feels great. But I think I've seen most of it, with this team at least, and I don't see myself playing for 5 more cycles. Therefore, I decided it was a good time to end it here at cycle 16, which is also why I used a few more egos than usual. And so, I headed for the terminus, and it's time for Sign of Roses. So coming in, I had no idea what high cycle or sign of roses would look like. I knew the passive mitigated the cycle count damage bonuses, which is nice, but the additional 80% increased max HP made me think it wouldn't be short. Game plan is simple, kill the roses while sinking accumulates, then exterminate the thing. Increasing gloom damage helps with that. For this I brought the classic sinking team with Anglo. I used my first turn to prepare the terrain for sinking on the flesh while healing, waiting for roses. The colors are a bit annoying. All roses have high health and clash values. I check the corrosion targeting, and in the end, I decide to try to avoid damage with clashing, luckily, having good skills.
방식인가? 오자 터트려주지. 다시 복구하긴 힘들걸요? 그래도 언제나 추월할 수는 없으니까. 어, 현명한 판단이요. 에? 주마 오, 머리 좋다 저 사람들 방금 저, 완전 좋았어. Their stagger thresholds are pretty high, so with a bit of order management, I stagger the one missing without clashing while starting to kill them.적확한 한합이었어. 너도 걸레짝이 되어버렸군. 완전히 녹아내렸네? 좋아. 잘 됐네. 나이스! 하나 죽였다. In the end, I managed to barely kill them all in three turns, leaving me with sign of roses. But it's not just a sign of roses, it's a sinking sign of roses. 
Like the others, it will not resist the 40 sinking on its parts, especially with a slightly heightened gloom weakness. ジャンブラン。ブイが直感났어。계속해도 in the end, I managed to deplete its health pool before it can summon back some roses, avoiding me more headaches, and officially ending this run. And so, here we are, the end of this run. I let you appreciate the total damage is inflicted and tanked. Ha! Ah, finally! I feel relieved and happy. This run lasted 16 cycles and 768 turns. That's... a lot. Let me just... Uh... There we go. Shall we do a bit of retrospective before we end? It was both fun and frustrating. Some of the ideas were well executed, and Way of Passenger was actually a blast to figure out. However, there were also misses. Mainly the fact that Keiko Ponglu is close to the only thing you can call a tank by the end. It was an incredible display of Evade's usefulness, though, but I doubt that was their goal. Knowing all that, I could have had a better team. My choice of buff could have been more varied too, depending on the situation. Like maybe focusing less on bleed and more on damage. I could also have spent 200 retries per fight to avoid using egos, but I'm not that much of a masochist. I know that you don't want to, but it did end up being a retry festival a lot of the time. But if that wasn't the case, you would just be hard blocked at certain point being like, well, guess I'll die. For my team, I should have uptied and swept spin more before too. The corrosion random targeting makes 7 attack weights valuable in some situation, and defense skills having sins would have given me a few more resources. I didn't really need them, but it would probably have saved me quite a few troubles. In the end, I think I'm just excited for next railway, mainly the new up nose, but I hope they refine it a bit more for next time. I know they had trouble with this one, but it's starting to be a bit too recurring. But I have faith in them. Faith that they don't redo a steam fucking machine. And that concludes this video. Final words, I have one final video planned before season 3 release. I hope I'll have time to finish it before. It will be 10 times shorter though, so it should be okay. I started making analysis shorts for new IDs and egos, and will probably keep doing them for the coming ones. Probably do this for the next BP, I'll see. In the meanwhile, that was long enough for now. See you next time, and keep your sanity high in this slow descent into the inferno. <laughs>